in the services where we observe the Lord's Supper, we depart from our usual reading from the Old Testament to read one of the passages concerning the suffering and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this evening, we're at Mark chapter 15, and we begin at verse 21, and I'll read through the end of the chapter. Now they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place, Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, together with the scribes, mocked and said among themselves, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard it said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that, he cried out like this and breathed his, saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Less and of Joses, and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. And when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, observed where he was laid. Amen. Please take your Bibles now once again and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. And then I also want to read from 
Romans chapter 6. So I'll first read from 1 Peter 4. And that'll actually be my text for the sermon, but I want to uh, begin as well with Romans 6. So first of all, 1 Peter 4, verses 1 through 3. There we read, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in licentiousness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And then back to Romans 6, I'll read the first 12 verses of that. Romans 6, verses 1 to 12. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Amen. Well, let's once again ask for God's help as we come to the preaching of the word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and ask now that you would teach us from it by the working of your Holy Spirit that we might have a better understanding of Jesus Christ's work on our behalf and of his expectations of us as his people. We thank you for this good confession that these three have made this evening and ask that now as they have publicly, are publicly identifying this night with Jesus Christ and with his body, that they would have a good beginning as those who have publicly put their faith in Christ and that it will lead to a good ending as well. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. From the passage I just read, Romans 6, verses 1 and following, you can see that part of the significance of baptism is that it represents our union with Christ. And part of that, our union with Christ, means that at some level we have a shared experience with Christ. In verses 3 and 4, we are told that he died, and therefore 
we died if we are believers in him. Verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For Christians, this is true. Christ died on the cross, and because they are in him, they died to sin when God saved them. And just as Christ rose from the dead, then when you believed in Christ, you rose from the dead to walk in newness of life. That is, as someone who is no longer serving sin, but who is serving Christ. He experienced something, you experienced something similar because of your union with him. Similarly, as I said, because he arose, that means we arose. He died, we died, he arose, we arose. And this dying and rising is a one-time event that's referred to here that has great practical implications. It's not just that we say, yeah, I died because I was in Christ. I believe in him, and that's all there is to it. No, Paul says it is something that affects our lives. It does affect our lives if we're Christians. It must affect our lives if we call ourselves God's people. The practical implications are stated there in the last three verses I read, verses 10, 11, and 12. Paul says, for the death that he died, that's Christ, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Now there's a very similar statement in 1 Peter 4 that we read just a few minutes ago. There's a very similar idea in verse 1 of 1 Peter 4, and that is that our experience parallels Jesus Christ's experience in some way to some degree. I'm going to come back to Romans again in just a moment if you want to keep your finger there, but look at 1 Peter 4, 1, because that actually is my text for this message this evening. 1 Peter 4 and verse 1. Notice how it's stated there. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I believe there's a sense in which that one verse kind of summarizes the teaching that we have in those first 12 verses of Romans chapter 6. I'll try to make that case a little bit in a moment, but just go back to Romans for a minute because I want to show four things from this text in 1 Peter 4.1. And the first thing is this, that Christ suffered in the flesh. It states there at the beginning of this verse, therefore since Christ suffered for us in the flesh. Now look at Romans 8 verses 1 through 3. Romans 8, 1 through 3. There it speaks of Christ suffering in the flesh. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Well, that's referring to Jesus' actual death on the cross when it says God condemned sin in the flesh. That means when Jesus was dying on the cross, God was in him condemning sin. He was condemning the sin that has held his people captive, and he has broken the power of it when Jesus died on the cross. But you see the language. God condemned sin in the flesh. That is, in the flesh of Christ, 
when he died on the cross. Now you can go back to 1 Peter, and you don't need to keep your finger there. 1 Peter, and let's look at 1 Peter 3.18, where Peter, just a few verses earlier, made a similar statement about Christ dying or being put to death or suffering in the flesh. 1 Peter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So chapter 4, verse 1 says he suffered in the flesh. Chapter 3, verse 18 says he suffered once for sin. And then it explains that by saying he was put to death in the flesh. So the first thing we see from this text is that Christ suffered in the flesh, and it's referring to his dying on the cross. That's the first thing. The second thing we want to see from this text is that it asserts that we, that is Christians, have suffered in the flesh. Christ suffered in the flesh, but now it says that we as Christians have suffered in the flesh. It says, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind for, and here's the statement now, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now I believe that there's a partial reference to Christ there, but also a reference to us. He's saying something, I believe, about conversion. There are a number of different ideas about what exactly it is that Peter is talking about here when he says, he who has suffered in the flesh. Some writers say, well, that's referring to persecution. And we know that that's the case for this reason, because persecution is a very significant theme in this epistle of 1 Peter. I think that this epistle was preached here a few years ago, and I'm sure that that was one of the notes that was sounded over and over again. These are people who are suffering persecution. So it would be natural that Peter would make a reference to their suffering in the flesh, meaning they're being persecuted. And there are statements in the Bible, texts, that would seem to be parallels to this. He who has suffered in the flesh, meaning suffered persecution, has ceased from sin. Listen to these two statements from Psalm 119. Verse 67 says, before I was afflicted, that is, I went through some suffering in this life, I went astray, but now I keep your word. In other words, I went through some trial in this life, in the flesh, and through it God has sanctified me. Or similarly, in the same stanza of Psalm 119, verse 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I may learn your statutes. You see how that would be a parallel then to this statement. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. But I think there are good reasons to say that this statement is rather a parallel with the passage I read and we looked at in Romans 6. And let me give you three reasons. First of all, Romans 6 is also a legitimate parallel to this passage. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Listen to verse 7 again from Romans 6. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So that's also a legitimate parallel. Another thing I would point out is this. The immediate context here has to do with our being like Jesus Christ. Since Christ suffered... You arm yourselves also with the same mind he had. And then it says, For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And I'll say something more about that in a few moments. We'll look at Hebrews chapter 9. But then another reason is this. When you take the statements of this passage here, I read the first three verses a few moments ago. They are better explained, I think, by referring to conversion than by referring to persecution that Christians endure. The last part of verse 1, once again. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
That's pretty strong language to say has ceased from sin. Verse 2, so that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Now when is that more true? After someone who has gone through persecution or after God has saved someone by converting him? Now we say he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. We don't have to wait until we undergo severe persecution for that to be true. Some of us may never. We're still waiting. But it's always true of us as Christians. We have spent enough time living for the lusts of men. It's time as of our conversion to live for the will of God. And likewise, verse 3, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in licentiousness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. So when it says we have suffered in the flesh, it's talking about Christians, and I believe it's referring to our conversion. Exactly how does he mean that we have suffered in the flesh? I can't explain that. But I'm convinced that's what Peter is referring to. So the first thing, Christ suffered in the flesh. The second thing, we Christians, all of us, not just those who have been persecuted in some uh, uh, difficult way, but all Christians have suffered in the flesh. And then the third thing, it mentions the effect, the effect of that suffering in the flesh. And that's the last part of the verse. We have ceased from sin. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And I said, I believe this statement, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, applies both to Christ as well as to us, the people of God. How could that be true of Christ? He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I think it applied to him this way. It does apply to him this way. Christ having died, he will no longer suffer for sin or deal with sin. He doesn't have to deal with sin anymore. He dealt with it, as it says in the Bible, once for all when he died on the cross. So I believe that statement includes Christ because there's a legitimate sense in which this applies to him. Let's just look at a few texts in the book of Hebrews. Go back to Hebrews 9, 27 and 28, first of all. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. There we read, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, and here's the important phrase, apart from sin for salvation. Now obviously it doesn't mean apart from sin in terms of his sinning. He never sinned. He appeared, in that sense, he appeared the first time apart from sin. He never sinned. What does it mean he will appear again apart from sin? Not to deal with sin. To have nothing to do with atoning for sin and condemning the power of sin. Why? Because he's done it once for all when he died on the cross. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. It's true of Christ in that way. He has never sinned. We read that in Hebrews 7 and verse 27. He, he, he doesn't need daily to offer up for his own sins. Why? Because he doesn't have any sins. And then chapter 9 and verse 12, look at the statement there in Hebrews. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. What he did when he was on this earth and when he died on the cross did have to do with sin. But now he's done because he died once for all and he dealt with sin one time, never to have to deal with it Again, in chapter 10 and verse 10, to the same effect. By that will, that is the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He did have to do with sin, 
at one time, but he doesn't anymore. For Christ, this statement is true. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That's true about him. But it's also true about us Christians, the people of God. How is it true about us? It's true about us in this way, that a death blow has been dealt to our sins. That's the teaching of the scripture about Christians. A death blow has been dealt to sin. Now, it's not the same thing as for Christ. It's something different. When we say, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, and we're talking about Christians, we're not saying that our suffering in the flesh does anything to atone for sin. That's what Christ's death did. We're not saying that our suffering is substitutionary. Christ's suffering was. We're not saying it has anything to do with bringing about the forgiveness of sins. His death did. Furthermore, our death is not like his in relation to sin in that he was not a sinner at all. We are. But he suffered in the flesh and he was done, Scripture says, dealing with sin. Well, Scripture says similarly for us, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Notice what it says in the next two verses there, verses 2 and 3. That he, and now it's clearly talking about believers and not about Christ, that he no longer should live his, the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Christ never lived for the lusts of men. But for us, this is true. If we have suffered in the flesh, we should look at it this way. We've ceased from sin. We're done living for the lusts of men. Or likewise, verse 3. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in licentiousness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And you could be thinking, well, pastor, don't you know that even after we become Christians, we still sin? Yes, I know that. But I ask you, do you know how the Bible tells us to think and how the Bible tells us to live as the people of God? With this attitude, I'm done with that stuff. Amen. Just look at a couple of other texts with me. 1 John 3, verse 6 and verse 9. 1 John 3, verse 6 and verse 9. Whoever abides in him, that is in Christ, does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. And then verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed, that is God's seed, remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now, John knows as well as you and as well as I that true Christians still do sin. He's not saying Christians live a life of sinless perfection. But what he is saying is this, the same thing Peter is saying. If someone is a real Christian, then his relationship to sin has drastically changed. That's what he's saying. And look at Galatians 5.24. Galatians 5.24. I'm simply trying to show you that this is not just a unique teaching of Peter or of John, but this is what's taught throughout the New Testament. This is what Paul teaches as well in Romans 6 and then in Galatians 5. Galatians 5.24. He says, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Remember when I was preaching on sanctification, I said there's progressive sanctification, but there's also this great work of sanctification right at the beginning of the Christian life when someone dies to sin. And this kind of radical language is used because there's a huge change in a Christian's relationship to sin. Paul expresses it here this way, they have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. John expresses it this way, he cannot sin. And Peter expresses it this way, 
he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. They're not talking about living above sin. But they're using very strong language to say there's a radical difference when a, in a Christian in relationship to sin from a worldling. And then likewise, Romans 6, once again, verse 14. Romans 6 and verse 14. And this is how you should look at Paul's statement here. You don't look at it as a statement that says, now that you're a Christian, you therefore have no moral obligations. That is a complete misunderstanding of this statement. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. How is that typically read in our day and age? Now that I'm a Christian, I don't have to worry about God's commandments. But when you put it in light of what we've seen already from this passage, 1 Peter 4, 1 John 3, Galatians 5, how do you read it? For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. I'm a Christian saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, I have a completely different relationship to sin anymore. And whereas before, when sin said jump, all I could say was how high. Now I say, no, you are not my master anymore. So before we go on to the fourth thing then from this text, the question is, for everyone here tonight, have you suffered in the flesh? Whatever that exactly is, has it happened in your life? Have you suffered in the flesh? Whatever exactly that means, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm sure it's referring to conversion. So I'm asking, have you really been converted? And I know the effects of it. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Do you have a completely different view towards sin than you had before you were saved? Do you have a completely different view of sin than the typical worldling that you rub shoulders with in the workplace or at school? A completely different view of it. For instance, if you say, I'm a professing Christian, but I can't say I look at sin in that radical way. I'm done with it. I mean, I know we're all sinners, and so why make such a big fuss? We're all going to sin until we die anyway, aren't we? Why make such a big deal out of it? Why get all bothered uh, about it? Why, why get uh, hot under the collar about it? Why make such a big deal about it? Our attitude towards sin should not be that. Our attitude towards sin, if we're Christian, should be, I'm done with that. I'm done with that. That should be your belief. That should be your attitude. Not that you mark out and protect a space in your life for sin. So that if someone comes and talks to you about that sin, you get all defensive. Well, why are you talking to me about that? Why are you telling me that I, I shouldn't be involved in this or that? I'm a Christian. That's why I'm telling you. He who has suffered in the flesh, Scripture says, has ceased from sin. You don't defend your sins if you're a Christian. Neither should you if someone wants to admonish you faithfully about some sinful practice in your life. You should not start getting defensive. You shouldn't resent it. You shouldn't fume about it. Why does that person want to talk about that area of my life? Why doesn't he talk about the, the good things in my life? Why talk about those things? And that means if you've suffered in the flesh, that means if someone wants to point out sin in your life, like the Apostle Paul or like the Apostle Peter, you don't condemn them as legalists. That's what I'm saying. Have you suffered in the flesh? I confess 
that there are areas of sin in my life that I constantly fall on my face to one degree or another. It's like the Apostle Paul, isn't it? What I would do, that I do not. And what I would not do, that I do. But Paul doesn't take a laissez-faire attitude to the fact that he falls into sin. He says, wretched man that I am, God help me through this. And if you come up to me, and God help me if this is not the case, and if it's, the ca if it's not the case, I want you to tell my fellow elders. You come up to me and you want to talk about an area of sin that you observed, observed in my life. My attitude is not to be, what do you mean meddling into my life? Why are you saying that to me? My attitude is to admit that those things are sin. That's a Christian way of dealing with it. Because we have a different relationship to sin. To confess your sin when it rears its ugly head. To regret that you still have to deal with it. Not to resent that someone wants you to deal with it. To hang your head if you're reproved. To agree with your reprover. Yes, it is so, and you don't know the half of my sins. To thank him for his faithfulness. Let the righteous smite me. It's a kindness. And to pray for grace to overcome it. That's what I mean. When I say, I say a completely different attitude to sin. And that's what Peter is getting at when he says, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. He doesn't mean he has entered into a life of sinless perfection. Have you suffered in the flesh? And if you're not a believer and you don't even profess to be a believer, I ask you the question as well. Have you suffered in the flesh? The obvious answer is no. You wouldn't even say you think you have. And let me just say this to you. Suffering in the flesh sounds pretty bad. I would just say this. It's not as bad as it sounds. It leads to a very good life. A life with a clear conscience and the smile of God upon you. And it leads ultimately to eternal life in heaven itself with God himself. You should go to Christ this very day and not be afraid of suffering in the flesh, whatever that means. It's a good thing. But another question is, if you've suffered in the flesh, you are a Christian, are you willing to keep on? And if your answer is, yes, I am, then this is Peter's concern here. And that leads us to the fourth point in the text. The first is, Christ suffered in the flesh. The second is, we Christians have suffered in the flesh. The third is, the effect is, that we have ceased from sin. Here's the fourth point. We are to arm ourselves for the battle. We are to arm ourselves for the battle. Three people have been baptized here tonight. They have publicly proclaimed, in other words, we have suffered in the flesh. The exhortation for them, for you three, and for all of us here tonight who are the people of God is this. We must arm ourselves for the battle. Two main exhortations. The first is this. How do you do that? First, you must begin with the mind. Notice how Peter states it. Therefore, since Christ suffered for, in the, in the, for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, the same way of thinking, the same attitude. What does he mean? Well, at least first of all, it means a change of mind, like I said, towards sin. Part of the Bible's teaching on repentance is this. In repentance, a person senses that his sin is dangerous and that it is filthy. He has a different way of looking at it than when he was an unbeliever. When he was an unbeliever, it's the water that he swam in. It's the air that he breathed. Now it's odious to him. Furthermore, a change of mind means the person mourns over his sin. He doesn't get upset because he was caught in his sin. He's upset because he sinned and because he sinned before God. And he hates his sin. He hates it. It has to begin with the mind. And that's all in keeping with the way Jesus views sin, isn't it? That's his view of sin. He hates it. 
It is odious to him. The point is, when Peter says, arm yourselves with the same mind, he says, if God has brought you to that point where you think of sin in that way, keep on thinking that way. There are many people who have thought that way for a little while at the beginning of their Christian profession. They were very, very zealous. They were very, very careful. Some of them you watched for a period of years or you found out about some years later. They weren't that way anymore. Some of them don't even profess to be Christians anymore. What Peter is saying, you began that way, keep on with that attitude towards sin. A second thing in terms of arming yourself for the battle and beginning with the mind is you must believe that any suffering God calls you to endure is worth it. Look at Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 4. Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 4. And this ties in with what we've heard about the temptation of Jesus as well. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Jesus did. He resisted against sin to the point of shedding his blood. We should be willing to do that if God calls us to do that. You should believe that any suffering God calls you to do endure is worth it. It is better to die, we should think, than to sin. May God give us that attitude, brethren, and enable us to maintain it for all of our days. And then the third thing is this. When I say you must begin with the mind in arming yourselves for the battle, you should have the conviction that if you are a Christian, then this is is the way it is. 1 Peter 4.1 Arm yourselves with this same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. If the Bible is true, if the gospel is true, then this is true. And this is the way it was for Christ. He suffered, he ceased from sin. God is going to make certain that this is the way it is for you if you are his child. You've ceased from sin. Not that you become sinlessly perfect, but that this happens in your life. Sin keeps rearing its ugly head. And you then treat it like one of those games where the little heads pop up and you've got to keep banging them down. Or you look at it this way, I keep falling on my face, but like the proverb says, the righteous man falls seven times and he rises again. That's the Christian life. It's a battle. Presume that that is true and that's the way it is going to be for you. And don't be one of those people who starts off well in the Christian life. And like with many people, God puts a hedge around a new Christian and makes his life joyful and he spares them from serious trials and trouble and then he starts getting into those trials and as Jesus said, they fall away. Don't let that happen with you. You're being told right at the outset, this is the way it is. Believe it. So it starts with the mind. The second thing is this, in terms of arming ourselves for the battle, you must fight the good fight. You must fight the good fight. When I preached on sanctification some months back, probably some years back now, whatever, I said then there are different ways that we fight against sin. One way is we abstain from it. We just stay away. Peter mentions that in 1 Peter 2, 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts 
which war against the soul. Keep away from them. Be like Joseph running away from Potiphar's wife. I'm out of here. Like Paul said, flee immorality. Flee youthful lust. Run away. Sometimes an army, even though it's not defeated, knows the best thing to do is retreat. We see what the enemy has. We're not ready for it. We're getting out of here. We'll come back on another day. But then there's another way that the Bible tells us to deal with sin. Not by running away, but by killing it. And that's what Peter is talking about here. In chapter 2 he says, stay away. Here he says, arm yourselves. Arm yourselves. And the word that's used there is a verb form of the word that is translated in other places, armor or weapons. So it reminds us of the statement, Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, put to death your members that are on the earth. There it doesn't say, flee immorality, run away. There it says, kill it. Put it to death. Fight against it. Do violence to it. Go after it with violence and with vengeance, like Jesus' illustration. You want to deal with sin in a right way? Cut off your right hand. Gouge out your right eye and cast it away from you. Fight against sin. Just like Jesus, like we saw in the temptation and we're going to see in the coming weeks. Use the scripture to fight against it. Pray with all your heart. Make yourself accountable to people. Your spouse, a Christian friend, your pastor. Are you serious about dealing with sin? Do whatever it takes. Don't you look at that sin that way? Don't you look at sin in a scriptural way? Or do you as a Christian, when you sin, say, well, it's just a little sin? Little sins become big sins. It's just a secret sin. Secret sins become open sins. Your sin will find you out. Oh, but I'm a Christian. It's covered in the blood of Christ. What does this statement mean? You tell me. The wages of sin is death. You let it sit. You let it grow. Paul says, here's where it ends. Not in heaven. In hell. The wages of sin is death. That's true for an unbeliever on the street. <laughs> and I should say that's true for me. Who was Paul writing to in Romans 6 anyway? The unbeliever on the street? To the church at Rome. The wages of sin is death. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I am not saying you gain heaven by your mortification. You gain it by one way. The blood of Christ shed on the cross. The Bible is simply telling us how those for whom Christ's blood was shed, live. He's telling us what their relationship to sin is. Have you determined to do whatever it takes to deal with sin? Anything and everything short of sin, it's sinning itself. May God give you that attitude, and may God help you to maintain it for all your days. And when you are tempted to give up, look to Jesus Christ. As it says in Hebrews 12, fix your mind on him. And say to yourself, I should be willing to do what he did and even spill my blood if God calls me to it in fighting against sin. He did not hang on the cross to leave you in your sins. And brethren, he gives us the Lord's Supper so that we will be constantly reminded to keep looking to him. You cannot fight against sin in your own strength. Nobody can. This is the gospel. The gospel is not just a free ticket to heaven. The gospel is the way that we, as Christians, live our lives. May God help us to do so in accordance with his word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the profession of faith that these here have made this night we thank you for what the Word of God teaches about Christians and death to sin 
and our new relationship to sin. And Father, we confess that though we are Christians, we love sin too much. We commit sin too easily. We are too careless. We don't take sin as seriously as we ought. But we thank you for your word, which admonishes us faithfully. We thank you for your word that spurs us on to love and good works, as the scripture says. And we ask that that would be the effect of what we've heard tonight, both for these three who have been baptized, Jared and Dom and Lisa. Father, help them to run the race that is set before them and to fight the good fight in the power of Jesus Christ and help us all as well. Father, we know even if we've been in the way for a long time, it doesn't get easier. Help us by your grace. Help us to persevere to the end that we might be welcomed into eternal dwellings by your Son, the Lord Jesus, with those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Help us now to remember Jesus Christ in his death as we observe this supper of remembrance, and we ask it in his name. Amen.